And so um, before I begin, I just want to let you know that the visual that you're seeing now, um, which is called a, a concept map, um, the graphic that you see on your screen, um, it will be available to everyone online after the webinar is over. Uh, we will send you a link to it um, via email. And you'll see that for each concept on this map, if you hold your mouse over the concept, you'll see that some icons appear. Um, and those icons you can click on for more information. So for instance, um, this icon is a link to a PDF called Applying to Graduate School, Differences Between the Grad and Undergrad Experience. So we encourage you to read through these resources uh, in more detail after the webinar is over and to sort of rest assured that you'll have access to all this information um, later on so um, it will be available to you. And again, just to reiterate, if you have questions as we're going through the presentation, go ahead and, and type them into the chat box now. And uh, Carlo will help us uh, save those questions and we'll go through and try to answer as many as we can um, at the end of the webinar. So I just want to start out by talking about kind of what is the difference between the undergrad and the graduate school experience, because there's some major differences. So first off, in terms of funding, um, in general, in the STEM disciplines, STEM being science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, the vast majority of students receive full tuition support, um, plus a small stipend for living expenses. Um, so really, they pay you. Um, Generally speaking, you should not have to incur debt um, to complete a graduate degree in the STEM field. Another difference will be research. So as a graduate student, your focus will be on research rather than you know, completing coursework and exams as it might have been when you were an undergraduate. So you will be focused on your own thesis or dissertation project. Another difference is having a faculty advisor. So you're really kind of expected to identify a potential faculty advisor. Um, so part of the graduate application process is identifying a faculty member whose research interests align with yours and with whom you think you would like to work. So this faculty member can actually then be kind of your sponsor or advocate during the application process. And of course, you can switch advisors once you actually enroll. Still, it's not advisable to apply to a program blind um, without having identified at least one or two faculty members whose research interests really align with your own. Another major difference would be class size. So even, at a, even if you attend your graduate um, courses at a large institution, the, the courses themselves are usually small seminars um, that focus on discussion and group work. So, so not the large lectures that you might have experienced as an undergraduate. And then one other difference is independence. So as a graduate student, much of your time will be unstructured. Um, it will be up to you to make internal deadlines um, and to complete necessary tasks. And really, you are your own best, best advocate in graduate school. It is really expected that you will actively seek out help um, and seek out advice as needed. So kind of moving along to the topic of um, getting paid to go to graduate school and what the potential funding sources are available, I'm going to pass it off to my colleague Chris to talk about um, fixed funding. Uh, thanks, Liv. Um, Carla, I have one thing to say before we start. I just got a phone call on the other line of a group from Virginia Tech uh, that was unable to get through the COSI site saying it was limited to 100 people. So I, I just wanted to give you a heads up. Okay, we have. Any. Yeah, I have. I have one email um, that says something to that effect from another group, but we have 159 in here now, so That's I will. I'm looking into that at the moment, um, but we will see what happens. Okay, sorry, I just wanted to point that out. No, thank um, you for thank you for okay. the heads up. <laughs> Yeah. So, um, so for fixed funding, uh, fixed funding is uh, site-specific funding, meaning it's tied to a specific college or university. And a good example of these are the most common methods of graduate support, which would be teaching assistantships and research assistantships. Uh, in a teaching assistantship or a TA, you would be required to assist a professor in teaching an undergraduate level course. So, for example, you might be in charge of teaching lab sections, or you may hold office hours, help answer questions, or help grade exams. Uh, in a research assistantship or an RA, uh, it was where you would assist a faculty member on their research project, uh, perhaps by collecting data, running experiments, 
analyzing data, or even participating in publishing findings. Uh, these are positions offered by the university you're attending, and the pay usually covers tuition and provides a small living allowance. And these usually require these positions usually require about 20 hours of week a week per, of work. Uh, other types of funding would be departmental fellowships. A uh, good example of a departmental fellowship are the IGERT traineeships. And IGERT, the acronym stands for Integrative Graduate Education and Research Traineeships. And these are programs funded by the National Science Foundation. There are about 200 uh, located at colleges and universities nationwide uh, with a focus on interdisciplinary team-based graduate education. They are funded at over 30000 a year, along with support for tuition and fees. And these are all interdisciplinary doctoral programs. Uh, for example, we have the REACH IGERT um, up on the screen. There's photos there. This formerly was known as the Biological Invasions IGERT at the University of California, Davis. And in this program, students study various types, study various types of invasive species in the Davis area ranging from plant to marine-based species. And this cohort, in this particular cohort, they're all different, brings together students from a variety of the environmental sciences, as well as bringing to the team a history major who's documenting the history of biological evasions and, uh, in the state, and a communications major assisting with outreach and public policy. The IGERTs uh, are, have the disciplines vary. A few examples would be like robotics, wind technology, and genomics. Um, but there, there are many, many different programs, and all of these can be searched by discipline on our website, so that's a very good way to find one that might match your, your focus. Uh, faculty may also offer support similar to IGER under their uh, personal research grants, and you would learn about those as you go through the application process for a given department. Uh, now Liv's going to talk a little bit about some portable funding options. Okay, thanks. So um, in contrast to fixed funding, which is sort of tied to a specific college or university, portable funding is um, funding you can take with you to most or all colleges or universities. So it gives you a bit more freedom um, since you can generally take it anywhere. So one example um, are the National Science Foundation's Graduate Researchers Fellowship. So this is one of the larger fellowships in terms of the number of fellowships awarded each year. And it's also one of the most prestigious fellowships in STEM. So it provides a $30,000 annual stipend um, plus a $12,000 cost of living allowance. And the deadlines are very early in the fall for this. So if you are a undergraduate senior, for instance, you would want to be thinking about applying um, during, you know, preparing to apply during August and September. And the deadlines vary based upon your discipline. Um, also, NASA um, provides fellowships as well. Um, and the fellowships are generally in the range of a $30,000 stipend. And they are unique in that they involve pairing the student with a NASA mentor at a NASA center. The, students, the student spends the academic year working on campus um, with his or her faculty advisor. Um, then this work is supplemented by an eight to 10 week summer internship at a NASA center um, where the student works one on one with his or her NASA mentor um, on research that's still directly relevant to the student's master's or dissertation research. So one place to apply is um, the Aussie Solar, which is um, NASA's one-stop shop website. And it's intern.nasa.gov. And these are just a few pictures of uh, recent NASA fellowship recipients. Um, and um, we're also really lucky to here to have a, a guest speaker here from the Jet Propulsion Lab um, who will speak a little bit more about NASA fellowships and in particular some of the, the uh, mentors and other opportunities available at JPL. Um, and then in terms of other NASA opportunities, there's also a new fellowship called the Space Technology Research Fellowship, um, which is a, a separate application outside of Aussie Solar. And then there are many, many others. So you can search for fellowships on our website, um, pathwaystoscience.org. And I would encourage you to search for many and, and apply for many. You know, um, the worst that can happen is that you have to turn someone down. And then also, as you're investigating graduate school, um, you should also keep in mind that professional development support is really important. Um, I encourage you to see what types of support programs are available on the campuses to which you, um, you're thinking about applying. 
And remember that even if the specific department you're looking at doesn't offer something like this, there may be campus-wide programs available. Just a couple of examples. Um, AGEP, which stands for Alliances for Graduate Education and the Professoriate, is a support program. It provides, um, well, it's formed of alliances of institutions, and you can see the map on your screen shows that there are many institutions involved. And they provide all kinds of support from uh, social activities and professional development activities like dissertation workshops, workshops on negotiating job interviews and salaries. Um, they also offer uh, modest financial support for traveling to conferences um, to begin learning how to present your work in a conference setting, um, to begin networking with other researchers, and they can help with the job search um, once you're getting ready to graduate. Uh, another sort of example resource of a professional development program is a program called MSPhDs, which stands for Minorities Striving and Pursuing Higher Degrees of Success in Earth System Science. And uh, this is a small program that we actually host at IBP. And it brings students together from different institutions for three different phases of activities over a couple of years. Um, it does things like provide travel support to go to conferences, provides mini workshops on topics like networking, giving presentations, giving an elevator speech about your research, um, doing a poster session at a conference, and that sort of thing. So before we move on to how to apply, I just wanted to say, remember that each type of fellowship brings its own benefits. And often a mixed funding source is the best thing for a student. So for example, if you really want to teach in the future, you should definitely try to get a TA position so that you can practice your teaching skills you know, while you're not yet a professor. Also, an, you know, an RA position may be really valuable to you because you're working on a faculty member's funded project and as such, that faculty member is really invested in you. Um, on the other hand, portable funding like the NASA or NSF fellowships that we mentioned are really useful because um, they allow you to focus on your research without other responsibilities. And they may be really important as you're you know, finishing up writing your dissertation. So keep the big picture in mind. Um, and keep a uh, lookout for funding that is deferrable. Um, so deferrable funding meaning you can accept the award, um, but you can wait a year or two to draw on the funds. And also keep an eye out for funding that is stackable. Um, so meaning you can simultaneously use multiple funding sources. Um, so I'll pass it off to my colleague Chris, and she'll talk a little bit more about how to apply. Great. Thanks, Liz. Um, so uh, the the best, most basic way to get ready for applying for graduate school and fellowships, um, and many of these aspects happen simultaneously, is to create a timeline uh, keep, to keep you organized and remind you of which deadlines are fast approaching. So most deadlines for portable fellowships are in the fall. So if you're applying your senior year of your undergraduate degree, you need to be starting this process in August. Um, I want to suggest you really look at this time, this uh, timeline that we have up here, uh, which is brought to us by the Committee on Institutional Cooperation, or CIC. And it's very helpful, very detailed, and um, it provides you a month-by-month -month checklist uh, to help you get through each step. So anything that we're I'm saying about tips, keep in mind that we have this backup resource that um, will be available. So you want to start by searching for a program. We have two very helpful handouts. Uh, the outline the questions that you should be thinking of, uh, of asking when you're applying to a graduate school. But another resource we strongly urge all of you to take advantage of is our sign-up form on our uh, homepage of our website, Pathways to Science. Uh, it takes about five minutes to fill out, and uh, you'll immediately be sent a list of resources that match your academic interests. Uh, but additionally, you'll be sent periodic updates, usually about four a year from us, about opportunities and resources and friendly reminders such as warning of upcoming fellowship deadlines. Uh, we are also contacted by faculty who are searching for students to recruit, and um, we would put them in contact with students that are in our directory with disciplinary backgrounds uh, they're seeking to recruit. So if you want to receive these resources and opportunities, we encourage you to, to, to go ahead and, and fill out our sign-up form. Um, probably our best online um, resource is our searchable database, um, and that also can be found from our homepage. Uh, and I was going to ask Liv if we could take a look at that. 
um, to do a search for you, and this is on Pathways to Science. So you can search, you can use our database uh, to search by institution, uh, discipline, and geographic location, as well as refine your search a number of ways using our advanced search functions. But to give you a quick, uh, a quick example, we want to choose the user group graduate student um, in, our, in the drop bo down box of the user group or level of study. And I know that we have a, um, and then uh, what I uh, just looked at earlier today was selecting all engineering as a discipline. And then, that, and then you, you, you select search programs. And just using that quick search function, it brought up almost about 200 programs with matches. And each program in the list will bring you to our program overview. That would include a link to each individual's program website and the contact information for each program. So this is really, I think, a very helpful tool and, and one I would hope that you uh, would use and, and play around with to find in a variety of ways to refine your search. So um, once you do find a program with any school, you'll need to familiarize yourself with the department uh, to which you're applying. You need to research the faculty members you may want to work with. You want to make sure that you may want to work with one or more uh, people in a given department because faculty are often transitioning due to research or sabbaticals or for several reasons. So it's important you show your willingness to work with multiple people. When you do find a department um, that you think you feel is a good fit for you, ask if you can visit. Um, many schools have support to bring in interested candidates, and it would give you the opportunity to meet uh, and speak with potential faculty, but also, which would be very important, is to meet the current graduate students in that program. Are they happy? Are they getting published? And could you see yourself there for six years or more? Um, this would also be a time where you could be starting a dialogue that how, about how you'd be supported through your entire degree. What if you don't receive any fellowships? What type of departmental funding will be supporting you? And what are those ex expectations associated with your support? You definitely don't want to be, you do not want to be sending a blind application, as Liv said uh, at the beginning. You, you need to have a faculty advisor in place prior to submitting your application. Uh, so, um, so back to the time in a little bit. In August, in addition to starting your um, program search and contacting programs that interest you, you really want to start drafting your personal statement and reviewing and planning to take the GREs or the graduate education records test. Uh, many but not all graduate schools require the GRE and preparing is key. Um, an excellent resource would be GRE.org. This is a website with, with lots of free prep resources and it includes information of where to find uh, test fee waivers if you are a student that might be needing that support. Um, and going to that t our timeline again, it, the, CIC, it, the suggestion is to be prepared in August and be taking your GRE by October. Uh, in September, you'd want to be reviewing and rewriting your personal statement. Please take advantage of all resources available to you. Use your online uh, writing, your on-campus writing centers. Use your friends, your peers, your network. Um, your personal statement is very important very important to your uh, whole package. So make sure you have many sets of eyes reviewing your statement again and again. Uh, we also have a handout that we have uh, highlighted here about writing strong, pers strong essays and personal statements, and that, that can give you some more uh, pointers as well. Also, again, in September, this is when you should be applying for those portable scholarships and fellowships. Most of them have deadlines in late October or early November. Uh, and these are for the following academic year. And we, and it's, it's sort of somewhat heartbreaking because we are contacted a lot by students in G February or March of, a, of their, um, the spring semester of their senior year looking for funding for the upcoming fall. And in most cases, it's too late by then. You really need to be organized and applying early for all the funding possible in the early fall. So I just want to really stress that point. Uh, through October, November and December, you should be taking the GRE, in October preferably asking for letters of recommendation, and submitting your applications. So letters of recommendation. You really want to make sure you are at choosing people who will write you a good letter of recommendation. And a way to do this is, well, making sure that there's someone even asking them that point blank, would you write me a good letter? Uh, when you have a person, supply them with your resume and a supporting document which highlights the work you've done with them, whether it's in their class or research program, trying to make it just as easy as possible to, make, to let, help them write you the best letter possible. This also includes giving <laughs> the letter writer lots of lead time. 
and follow-up. In most cases, you can see online if your letter has been submitted to your program. Um, pleasant but persistent reminders are good and often very necessary. Faculty are very busy people, and they under but they understand the importance of the letters. So pleasant but persistent reminders are okay. Um, and here again, we have a, a supporting document uh, about how to go about cultivating strong letters of reference when you're um, starting that process. Uh, when you do learn of your acceptance status, make sure you follow up and thank the people who've written you letter of recommendations. And uh, after you submit your application, follow up. make sure you follow up with the department uh, and make sure your application was received. Uh, this is the type of conduct that really will make you stand out as a serious applicant. Um, so that's uh, uh, an overview, but please um, use the, so the supporting documents we've highlighted, um, tips for writing a personal statement, securing good letters of recommendation, and what to expect in graduate school, as well as the TIC um, packet uh, with the timeline and checklist. We will be sending you links to all of these materials uh, following the presentation, and they can be found on our website under our resources toolbox, which is on the undergraduate students page and the graduate students page. But, so be assured those are coming your way um, uh, following tonight. But uh, if you have any questions, what we've heard so far, we're, we'll be taking them at the end, but uh, please write them in the chat box if you have them so you don't forget them, and, and we don't forget them so we can follow up with you in the next few days if they don't get answered. Uh, at this time, um, I, I'm hoping we're fortunate enough to have two speakers. We, we know we have Adrian Ponce and uh, Elizabeth Tadia uh, Crespo who are here to speak about their work or, and their experiences. Uh, at this time, I would like to introduce Adrian Ponce, manager of the STEM Higher Education Group at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Hello, this is Adrian. Um, thanks for the introduction. Um, I guess uh, we got to scroll up to the first slide of that series. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I think that's the last one. And I hope you can hear me pretty well. All right, so my name is Adrian Ponce. I'm the manager for the higher education group here at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Um, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory is a, a federally funded research and development center. It's one of the 10 NASA centers, but it's run a little bit different than the others in that uh, it's a NASA facility, but all the people that work there are Caltech employees contracted to work for NASA. And we have about 5,000 employees at the facility, which you can see pictured here nestled into the foothills of uh, La Cañada and Pasadena. Um, and uh, it's, like I said, about 5,000 employees. It's distributed across about 177 acres of land which uh, is roughly equivalent to the size of Disneyland. And we have about the, you know, the same amount of fun working at JPL. Uh, a little bit of brief history. Uh, the lab got started in the 1930s, um, uh, where some rocket enthusiasts uh, from Caltech and the surrounding neighborhoods got together to do experiments. And initially, they worked on the Caltech campus, but they kept blowing things up. And so they were relegated to this uh, this sort of open landscape at the time. Um, later on in the World War II time frame, the, uh, it began to grow as a real laboratory, as a jet propulsion laboratory developing rockets um, and jet-assisted engines for having planes take off more quickly. And, uh, and the rocket industry, sort of the rockets, development really took off during the Cold War uh, era, uh, and a lot of those were developed in the you know, 40s and 50s. Uh, a lot of missiles were developed at JPL. But then there's a big shift uh, uh, when uh, in the late 50s we, we switched gears from developing rockets to developing spacecraft, and specifically spacecraft to do science. Um, and one of the very first experiments uh, uh, in spacecraft was with Explorer 1. That was the first American satellite launched. It discovered the Van Allen belt. And, uh, and so it really was driven towards the science. And ever since then, 
up to the present day, JPL has been known as a kind of science center. And before I switch to the next slide, um, just wanted to say a little bit more. You know, like I said, at JPL, I run uh, my group of program coordinators run a set of programs for students to come to work at JPL. And some we have programs for high school students, undergraduates, and graduate students, which is really what we're focused on today. And also postdocs, when you're, if some of you don't come here for your graduate work, there's an opportunity to come in for, to become a postdoc as well. And of course, as a member of the technical staff, uh, if you apply to those open positions in the future. And it's a fantastic place to work. Uh, just uh, really exciting, especially right now. Uh, if we go to the next slide. Um, uh, on, if you look to the right-hand panel, you see a picture of Mars, and that's timely because in about, um, uh, what is it, where are we at? Uh, August 5th, so what is it, a week and a half, two weeks time frame, uh, we're landing a new spacecraft called the Mars Science Laboratory, uh, which has the Curiosity rover on it. It's about the size of a small SUV, and it's going to be landing on Mars uh, on August 5th, and, and we'll usher in yet an, you know, another era of exploration where we're looking for habitability on the red planet, uh, places where uh, there may have been water or, or uh, sources of energy and such that we're going to be exploring. Uh, so there's a lot of room for, you know, to put together a mission like that. You need folks who are engineers, systems engineers, mechanical engineers, electrical, all flavors. You need scientists who are familiar with planetary science, and chemistry, astrobiology, um, and physics, uh, and also folks who develop uh, technology for the next generation instruments. Um, so, but we don't just look at the at Mars uh, at JPL. We look at all um, planets and even beyond. And so. On the middle top, I've shown the Earth, and that's just to remind me to tell you that we do about, we have about half of the instruments in the country uh, are operated by JPL, looking down on Earth to look at climate change, temperature, uh, um, ocean levels, where the snow cover is, and so on. So lots of Earth science going on and corresponding technology development for instruments for that. Uh, on the left panel on the top uh, is uh, um, sort of an applied physicist, Peter Tsao, who is holding this wispy material, wispy cloudy material. That's aerogel, which went on a spacecraft to um, capture particles from a comet. So, uh, and we have really, uh, if you go down to the next panel below, bottom left, we really have spacecraft uh, that we send to all planets. One's even going to Pluto right now. We'll be arriving in a few years. Asteroid belt. Uh, Cassini is around Saturn, making lots of discoveries right now. Um, and on the bottom panel, I'm uh, showing a sort of picture of the galaxy to remind me that we do astrophysics. You may have heard of the Kepler mission discovering exoplanets, planets that are orbiting around other stars. We're discovering that. Uh, almost uh, statistically, every star in our galaxy has a planet at least. And that's just uh, really um, captivating the scientific community in terms of the prospects for finding life elsewhere. Um, and so all of these, you know, all of the science and technology and engineering is kind of melded together here at JPL. These 5,000 employees are working together to make it all happen, and it requires all skills. And as part of making it happen, uh, we work with our academic partners, and a lot of our academic partners have graduate students. And the hope is that some of you will join an academic department and become uh, uh, part of the collaborations with JPL. And so, um, what you you know talk a little bit about that? So my brief sidebar here is beyond being a manager for this higher education programs, I'm also a mentor. And so uh, I've had students from all 
you know, different flavors of programs, undergrad and grad postdocs and faculty and so on, and um, did my graduate work at Caltech. Um, and so uh, I had, and I've had some of my own graduate students. And so what I wanted to share with you are some of the different pathways that you can take, because there are different options to work with folks at JPL and also with other NASA centers, and some of it was already mentioned. Um, there are fellowships that you can apply for, uh, some of them uh, uh, through, through NASA that will specifically fund you to do research at one of the NASA centers. And then there are fellowships uh, that, that are flexible. You can work at the NASA center or not, and you'll just have to look at the different um, you know, uh, descriptions, and some of those are going to be, you know, changing and are somewhat in transition, but the bottom line is, and I'll show this on our last slide uh, when we get to it, uh, there's a website that'll always be current, and so uh, you can check that from the JPL point of view. We, I can show you that website, and I'm sure uh, the uh, web website for, uh, I think, IB IBT, uh, huh? I be, what, is, what is the acronym for you yeah, guys? Yeah, that's right, IBT. Okay, good. I didn't want to say it the wrong. Uh, and you guys, they, they keep an up-to-date database as well. So in a changing environment, uh, you can always refer to the up-to-date databases that are out there. But there are different flavors of fellowships um, that are out there. And some of the NASA employees or JPL employees are also faculty at other at institutions like at Caltech or, you know, uh, USC or UCLA, and so sometimes it's really easy just to um, become have them as your faculty advisor and and um, and st start working at a NASA center. Um, in other cases, there may be a collaboration between a faculty member and a, a JPL member or a member of another NASA center. And you can tune into that. Um, what you need to do is, uh, as students to navigate through this kind of complicated variable space is be proactive. If you really, really want to work at a NASA center because you're passionate about space exploration, you have to explore all of your options. And that means you have to go to the various uh, websites of the faculty at the places that you want to do your graduate work and see who's doing what kind of research to see if they do have a collaboration. If they don't have a collaboration, maybe look at the NASA Center researchers through the websites that each of the researchers has at the NASA Center to see what kind of work they do, to see if you can find a pair, a, a NASA researcher and a faculty that can be paired up to maybe establish a new uh, kind of a collaboration where you as the graduate student serve as a kind of glue to to initiate the collaboration and make it go forward, but that requires you to be somewhat proactive. Um, and so when you do make contact with folks, uh, the big, I guess, piece of advice is that you, you really have to be prepared and have read some of the papers that have been published by the, the faculty or the NASA researchers. And uh, or at least look at their websites and see what they do. So you go in with some ideas and say, "Hey, I'm really interested in this because you you're, you've already w worked in this area." And so um, yeah, those are uh, kind of my two cents. And next, um, we can go to the next page. Uh, maybe we can go to that uh, link here. We have the JPL NASA Gov website. So from our perspective. You can go to that website and allow it. <laughs> I don't know if this will actually work, but we'll give it a shot. There's just we a have, little delay. But we have the technology. And by the way, I have no idea if I'm out of time or not, so you'll have to let me know. You're, you're doing fine, actually. Our second speaker was unable to dial in, so. Ah. Perfect. And then we're going to go to questions when you're done, Adrian. It's good to be long-winded sometimes. Okay, so if you go JPL NASA Gov, uh, you see education. You go up to the education at top bar in the middle. I don't know if you can see that. And hit education. Doop. 
I'll do the sound effects and go to internships and fellowships in the middle there. And maybe a delay in the... Yeah, I, I think there's a delay, but it's okay. There it is. And by the way, all you have to do is type in JPL internships and you'll come to the same page. Um, and you'll see a whole host of programs that are available. We have a JPL Graduate Fellowship, a year-round program that accepts. So to, sometimes what, what you can do is um, if you don't uh, have a, one of those traditional fellowships that have been mentioned, sometimes the mentor, the NASA researcher who, who might become your mentor, has funding to support students. Okay, and you can discover that by talking to them and say, you know, oh, I'm really interested in your project. This is really cool. I want to work with you on this. Uh, I don't have a fellowship right now. And they may say, okay, but I have funding from a research grant. And with that funding, uh, you can apply to this type of JPL graduate fellowship program, for example, and allow you to come work at JPL, either as part of your thesis program right, because you're working towards a thesis, or if you can't find a kind of collaboration with your faculty advisor, you might be able to take a kind of hiatus from your thesis work for 10 weeks and have a more of an internship experience. And so there are these two different types of flavors of experiences you can have. It can be an integral part of your thesis, and it's part of a collaboration between a J JPLer and your faculty advisor. Or you take some time off from your thesis work, you come to JPL, and you have a separate internship experience that teaches you some new skills, some new science or engineering or whatever, and moves the project forward. So yeah, so that's the website. Those are my um, thoughts. I'm, I'm a little bit unscripted here, uh, but I hope it's been kind of helpful. Uh, but I think we have some time for questions. 